It's good to be in God's house tonight. Amen. I hope there's nothing about coming here tonight that offends you in any way, shape, or form. Somebody say amen. Take your Bible, turn to John chapter 8. Um, let's, let's back up and get just a little bit of the context. Uh, when you get your Bibles there, say amen. But um, before we begin to read, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. We'll go through our, uh, our prayer list here in a little bit. A lot of things, a lot of people getting sick this time of year. A lot, some people are getting better. Praise the Lord for that. We're glad to hear about that. Father, we pray, dear God, that you'd bless your word tonight. Bless these people that have come out tonight. I thank you for them. Lord, don't want to take anybody for granted. Lord, I don't deserve anybody to come to my church. I don't deserve a big church. Father, I'm just thankful, dear God, for anybody to come and just sit down and listen. I thank you, Lord, for all the folk we have online and what a blessing they are to us and We just thank you, God, in knowing that they are with us and joining with us in spirit. And uh, through the uh, power of the Internet, we we thank you, dear God, for that. We know bad people do a lot of bad things with and on the Internet. Lord, we're going to use it for your kingdom and glory's sake. That is to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. And just to show just how much Jesus actually loves people. He's not mad at them. He wants to save them. He wants to love them and forgive them. And Lord, just help us to convey that, Lord, as we preach and teach through the gospel of John and everything that we say and do here. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, giving Michael a safe trip. We pray, dear God, that you would continue to bless his work, use him for your kingdom's sake. And uh, we are thankful, God, for all that you have done for us personally, for our families, for our church, through our church. We just love you for it, God. Bless your word tonight. Bless our fellowship tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, So let's get the context a little bit. I'm going to start on verse 28, but let's back up just a a few verses. And he says in verse 23, um, and he said unto them, ye are from beneath, I am from above, ye are of, ye are of this world, I am not of this world. Verse 24, he said, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, and, and this is important. Do you have to believe that Jesus is God in order to go to heaven? He just said so right here. If you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Sad to say, uh, even though the Mormons try to live a good lifestyle and like to show a fair showing of good works on the outside... They are very lost. They do not believe that Jesus is God Almighty. They will perish in their sins. Other groups that go around preaching and teaching everywhere, if they do not believe that Jesus is God Almighty, the United Pentecostal group is another one. They do not believe that in the Godhead, the Trinity, they don't believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And when you ask them about 1 John 5, 7, they will flat out tell you that that verse was added, should have never been added to the Bible, and, and, and we're supposed to ignore it because it's not supposed to be in the Bible. And yet, imagine somehow, some way, it's there. I'll be... So anyway, Jesus himself makes it an important issue, an important doctrine. Verse 25, then said they unto him, who art thou? Jesus saith unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. Uh, Verse 26, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Verse 27, they understood not that he spake to them 
of the Father. And, and, and remember that Jesus is speaking to his people. He is speaking truth to them. But some of these truths are given in the form of parables. Now, parables are not myths and they're not fables. Understand that. The parable of, let's say the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Is that a true story? I believe it is. You look at John or Luke chapter 16, Jesus did not say, let's pretend that there was a, a, a man, a rich man, and let's pretend that there was a poor man named Lazarus. He did not say those words. He said, there was a certain rich man. There was a certain rich man. There, and there was a man named Lazarus. Jesus knew both of them. And I had the Jehovah's Witness at my door trying to tell me that that was just a fable that Christ was telling. I said, no, it is a parable, but, it, it, but not a fable. And the difference is a parable is a true story. Jesus, and I reminded them, Jesus did not say, let's pretend or suppose that there is somebody like this. He says it plain fact. There was a certain rich man. There was a certain a beggar named Lazarus. There was these people. These people are real. They exist. Why would Jesus, and I believe this, you cannot lie to people to tell them the truth of the gospel. Cannot do it. And I would challenge anybody's evangelization efforts that if they include fables, mythologies, make-believe stories, or they're there under a pretense. In other words... They knock on the door, people come to the door and say, yeah, what do you want? Uh, yeah, we're from uh, uh, the uh, religious organization here in town. We're here to do a religious survey. No, they're not. They're there trying to get inside their house to teach them their doctrine. That's not, but they're not really there to do a religious survey. That's just a setup to get the people to the door. Why not just announce plain and true, hi, we're, your, we're from your neighborhood church. Uh, we would, we've never been by this house. We would like to come by and introduce ourselves, let you know that we love you. And as neighbors, we want to help pray for you. Is there anything that we can pray for you first of all about? And just be honest with them. We'd like to maybe at, at some point get a chance to talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. Is tonight a good night or tomorrow night? Is, would tomorrow night be a better night? Don't get, don't give them an option of no night. But anyway, I'll move on. But you cannot tell a lie and tell the truth of the gospel at the same time. God will not bless that. That's bearing false witness against your neighbor. So anyway, verse 28 now. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Now hold your place there in John 8, and let's look and see what he was talking about here. Turn over to Hebrews. That's where God makes coffee. Oh, come on, that was funnier than that. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, Then said I, this is what Jesus said before he came to the earth, Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So if Jesus didn't, couldn't quite remember everything he was supposed to do, 
Well, I'm sure he had a copy of the Old Testament somewhere around where he could read it and say, oh yeah, that, I got to do that part too. That's what he's saying here. He said, uh, when, when I am lifted up, then you shall, back in Luke uh, 8, verse 28, when I'm lifted up, in other words, when I'm lifted up on the cross, you're going to know, you're going to understand it, that I am he and that I, uh, uh, that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Verse 29, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. What do you, what do you think he means when he says, he that sent me is with me? Who's with him right now? Who is, who is with Jesus right now? Is not Jesus when he came, is he not Full of the seven spirits of God as prophesied in Isaiah 11. He is. So he has the spirit in him. And he that sent me is with me. The father hath not left me alone for I do always those things that please him. Verse 30 as he spake these words many believed on him. Isn't that something? They're listening to him, and all he's saying is the truth. He's not condemning them. He's not beating them over the head with how rotten they're living. He's simply telling the truth that my father sent me. I'm only going to do what he sent me to do. He's not left me alone. He that sent me is with me right now. And he, I believe he's referring to the seven spirits of God. And when people heard that, they just believed it. They were happy. They felt a peace when this man spoke that they had never felt in their life. The testimony of people that I read and Sometimes they'll call and share with me. Sometimes they'll write me a letter or an email and, and share with me. Pastor Mike, we, we put away all of our other religious material. And I got a, finally got a picture of a family. His family came several years ago. He's been a follower of ours for years. His family came for homecoming. He was supposed to come, but he had to work. And I've, I've just always wanted to meet him. He calls himself Barf. Um, Bible Truth Radio fan, Barf, and his name is Vernon. He finally sent a picture of him and his whole family, so I stuck it up in my office on a little plaque that they gave me. And uh, where was I going with that? It was really good for there for a second. I don't remember where I was going with it, but anyway. I've always, I, yeah, I've always, always wanted to meet him. I always wanted to shake hands with him and tell him I appreciate it and have some good fellowship time with him. But these people that are listening to Jesus, as they hear his words, they're believing what he's saying. And in believing, God is saving them. God is giving them his spirit because they believe what Jesus is saying. Many believed on him. Verse 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if, 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 underline the word if in your Bible, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. So let's say that, oh, let's see, see who can I pick on here? Let's say that, uh, Matthew grew up our house, listened to the Bible, been hearing me preach all his life. He gets to be up about 60, 70 years old and all of a sudden he decides he wants to be a Roman Catholic. Or a 
Jehovah's Witness. Or, see, what would you be good at? See, a Satan worshiper. You're going to shave his head, get a little goatee beard going, just look like Satan himself, let his fingernails grow long, paint them black, get him a big black cape on, candles in a pentagram, and everything like that. So let's read this again. He said, um, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Did Jesus con or did Matthew continue in Jesus' words? No. So what does that tell you about him? It tells you that he grew up in a pastor's house, played church all of his life. And what was underlying there was a Satanist ready to just pop out. And finally one day he couldn't hold it back anymore. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe after I died, he's just decided I'm not going to play this foolish game anymore. I'm going to be a Satanist. I'm going to listen to ACDC records. Highway to hell. Right? Or worse, Michael Jackson. <laughs> Thriller. Okay. So, he turns away from everything. You gotta keep believing. Don't stop. Huh? An apostate, yeah, an apostate. They have committed the sin of apostasy. And therefore, and so at that point, I believe their conscience is seared with a hot iron. God turns them over to a reprobate mind. Word reprobate is, comes from the word probation. We put somebody on probation thinking that they will do better and avoid having to go to jail or prison, okay? But if they keep coming back and committing crime after crime after crime after crime, at some point, the court deems them reprobate, meaning they're not going to change. And we need to lock them up and get them off of our streets because they're a danger to our community. Okay? So anyway, that's what that means. Um, let's see here. Verse, where was we on that one? 30. As I, and as he spake these words, many believed on him. Verse 31, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth. Oh, here it is. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Amen. It's not what it says. It's not what it says. Make you free. You know what they finally decided to do with Charles Manson before he died? I kept hearing, I kept hearing of one of the scariest nights that we ever had at our house growing up, when I was growing up, was my mom and my sister and I were home alone. Dad was out of town working, and we were watching the movie Helter Skelter that they made about Charles Manson. Who remembers that movie? We're playing it on TV, and we're watching this movie, and then all of a sudden, there's a noise on our back porch, and somebody's trying to get in the door. Clearly, clearly somebody's trying to get our house. And my mom tucked me and Melissa under her bed and she's standing there with one of dad's shotguns. She's ready to blow somebody away. And no, no kidding, she called the law out and the law, uh, the sheriff's department looked around for a while. We think it was a guy up the street that had meningitis and didn't quite think right. And he was just trying, trying to get in somebody's house and for no reason. He just didn't think right. And that's what we thought happened. But the scariest night of our lives 
Okay? So I would hear Charles Manson's name on the radio, how he's up for uh, probation or parole. And I'm going, oh, no, they can't let him out. He's going to come to my house and kill me. Oh, no. And I was scared to death. I was scared to death that they were going to let him out and he was going to come kill everybody in the whole country. Okay? And then I kept hearing, wow, they, they turned down his, his parole. And then finally, they had a, a, what ended up being the last parole hearing. They, they said he is institutionalized. Meaning that we can't let him out because he won't know how to live now on the outside world. He has been inside so long, we can't let him out. He's institutionalized. And they will revoke probation or parole permanently on people at that point because they have been institutionalized. And here's my point in this. You can open the cage of the bird. But if the bird has been there so long. He'll never leave that cage. Isn't that sad? He's been caged up. There's a, there's a, a goofy video on YouTube. Where a guy's got a big dog at home. And he's got a big, uh, he's got big front door and he opens the door and the second door is a big glass panel door and the dog's used to those glass panels there. Well, the guy took the glass panels out and he opens the door and he's outside begging the dog to come out and the dog won't come out because he thinks those glass panels there. And the guy walks through there and says, come on, boy. And he walks back outside and the dog still won't go outside because he thinks those glass panels are there and he can't get out. Listen, you can show people the way and lead them to the truth. That doesn't necessarily mean that they want to be free. Some people have just lived a life of sin so much. My wife and I were talking the other day about her brother, Steve. You, you girls, Matthew's uncle, Steve. And he's talking about his salvation and everything like that. And I just love how God saved him. And she said, you know, I, I, I wish he was still here. And I said, Lisa, maybe God knew that he wasn't meant to live a Christian life. Because when I first, when I first really got in touch with him after he got out of jail. And he had said that he'd asked Jesus in his heart in, in jail. And I baptized him here. He was still carrying a lot of baggage from the past. And I mean, he was carrying it. He, he was still drinking. The meth was still there. The women were still there. Everything was still there. And I knew he really wanted salvation, but all that stuff was still there. And he couldn't, he couldn't turn loose of it. And it wasn't until just one day... When his seventh wife kicked him out. That finally, finally, God pierced through all of that stuff and made a difference in his life. I could see the change in him, but it wasn't meant to last, I don't think. He was made free. But maybe God knew it wasn't, it wasn't going to last had he left him down here. So God took him at the right time. I believe things like that. So the truth can set you free, but sometimes people don't want to be free. The real truth, if you want it, will make you free. You believe it so much in your heart that you don't want 
the bondage anymore. You don't want the drugs, the booze, the sex. You don't want the lifestyle. You don't want it anymore. And God has opened the door of the birdcage. But you're afraid to get out. I witnessed to a guy and I spent hours talking with him and he and I knew him and I knew why he wasn't making a commitment. It's because he had been down to so many altars in his life. Down to the altar, confess the sins, turn them over to God, turn back around, go live for the devil for a while. It was Mike Henderson. Turn around, get down to the altar, get straightened out for a while, turn around, go live for the devil for a while. And I was over at his house and he said, Mike, I know what you're saying. I know everything you're saying is true. He said, my problem, he told me, he said, my problem is if I were to, if I were to bow tonight and confess every sin I've ever done and God forgave me of them, I'm afraid then six months it won't last. The difference between being set free and made free is that God has not only opened the door to the cage, but he's given you a reason to step out of it and finally be made free. And only God can do that. Only the truth can do that. Let me hear somebody say amen. Verse 33, they answered him, we are Abraham's. Oh, now they're going to brag and boast. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed and we were never in bondage to any man. Even though at that very moment, the Roman Empire ruled over Israel. Which I think is hilarious. We be the seed of Abraham. And how, how can you say we are in bondage? We are in bondage to no man. Except for Julius Caesar. Or whoever the Caesar was at the time. Pontius Pilate and the Roman soldiers. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Whosoever committeth sin is the servant. Of sin. That's, that's your problem. There's your problem right there. Your problem is that you have committed sins. Let's face it. That you liked doing. Roy, let me ask you a question. What's your favorite hard liquor? Jack Daniels. What's your... Least favorite hard liquor. Old crow. Old crow. Isn't that what you used to call Bonnie? Uh, uh, he's got scars to prove it too. So I may not be able to tempt you much with old crow. But if I had a. Big old jug of Jack Daniels. Or as them Cajuns say it, Jacques Daniel. Right? If I had a big old jug of that, that could get to you, couldn't it? Jack is your boss. And whatever Jack says to do, you did. Amen. That's just like meth. Meth is some people's boss. Whatever meth says to do, you do it. Or marijuana. Marijuana is the boss. Whatever marijuana says to do, you do it. Pain pills. Pain pills will rule your life. And whatever them pain pills, you'll, you'll do anything for them pain pills. 
You'll do anything for those things. They are the boss. Our fleshly desires. They are so strong and so powerful inside of us that they're the boss. Whatever they tell us to do, we do it. We obey it. And, and yet, here, it, here's what's funny. The people who don't go to church say, I'll go to no man's church. No man is going to tell me how to live except Jack Daniels. Bud Weiser, Mary Jane. And whoever else, whatever lovers you have that you can call just on a moment's notice and say, hey, can I come over? They're in charge. They're the boss. They tell you what to do. And you do it and you've got no power against it. Listen, I know, I know that feeling. I've been in this world. So he said, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Verse 35, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free... Ye shall be free indeed. How would you like it to wake up one day to find out that Jack is not in charge anymore? You have a new master now. That pain pills are not your boss anymore. That marijuana is not your boss anymore. My dad told Matthew, your grandpa Sterling. He said, if God hadn't delivered me from drinking that 905 beer, that was his favorite beer. You remember 905 beer? He used to have beer, 905 liquor stores all over St. Louis. You remember that, Roy? That was dad's favorite beer. It's cheap. That's that stuff they scraped off the bottom of the Budweiser barrels. But he liked it. And he said if God hadn't delivered him from drinking that, he'd be dead. He knew he was in bondage. He realized he was in bondage to it. He couldn't stop it. He couldn't stop it himself if he wanted to. And I'm sure he tried. I remember my, my mom years ago, she struggled. Her, one of her biggest struggles was smoking cigarettes. And if, if she was up going to church and everything like she's supposed to, she did okay. But friends from her past would come up and stay for a while. And when they did, usually mom went out and bought a carton. And she was at least honest. She would, she would say... If, as long as they're here and they're smoking, I want to smoke. And, and that's how it was for quite a while. Until fi finally God just delivered it from her. Just took her away from it. And you know what she did one time? I got so tickled at her, Melissa. We were at the grocery store one time. And a lady, this is back when you could smoke anywhere you want to, including an operating room. And um, this lady was emptying out her cart. She had a cigarette in her mouth. She took it out like that and held it back like this as she's emptying her cart out like this. And it's going right up mom's nose. And mom's just going, oh, God, oh, that's, oh, that's awful. What you, oh, get that thing out of my nose. Oh, 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 And after we got out of the store, she said, I just can't stand that. Somebody's cigarette shoved up my nose. And I wanted to say, Mom, I've lived like that for the last 13 years. <laughs> 
son, come here and let me tie your shoes. And then they put that between their lips and, and it's flopping up and down while they're talking. Um, look at verse 36. Listen to this. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Don't ever tell God that you can't be free. Because God will pull a trick on you and just one day make you free. Amen. You shall be free indeed. I know that you are... I know that you are Abraham's seed. Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Woo! I bet that made them mad. But now you seek to kill me. A man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. But what do you think he said to that? Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. Because that would make me your brother. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Now stop and think about that for a minute. Jesus, when he was on the cross, one of the last things he said was, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he said it like this, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Now, they knew those words, but they could not understand them. God gave them, it's almost like they were deaf to it, and they couldn't understand the words that Jesus was saying. What is he doing? He's, who's he calling to? Why is he calling to Elijah? That's not who he was calling to. Eloi, El, is God. Eli, or Eloi, is my God, my God. And they couldn't understand it. And he was quoting, had they understood that he was quoting Psalm 22, they would have referenced in their mind, they, they pierced my hands and my feet. They would have looked up there and they said, that's our Messiah, that's the Son of God. That's what they would have realized right then and there. But they never, they never figured it. To this day, they haven't figured it out. So he says, you don't understand my speech even because you cannot hear my word. Verse 44, you have your father, the devil, and the lust your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth and you believe me not, which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. And there was a bunch of them wanting to jump right up and pop him in the teeth and knock his teeth out. They hated him for what he just said. Instead of being convicted by what he said, instead of them saying, yes, you're saying the truth, you're telling me the truth. They just said, we're going to kill this guy if it's the last thing we do. All he did was come to tell them the truth. It's all he wanted to do. Well, let's wait on the rest of it. <laughs> 